Hello, and I'm at the Fireblocks office here in Singapore. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Ben Wilton, who is with Fireblocks from New Zealand. Yes. And he's going to be sharing with us on you know the trends and developments in the overall blockchain space and cryptocurrency space. So um, before we start, uh, for our audience who are not too familiar with Fireblocks, can you just give a brief introduction about the company? Yeah, sure. So um, Fireblocks is a digital asset management uh, technology platform. So what we allow our customers to do is to securely custody digital assets and then also use those assets in a secure way. So transferring those assets, committing them to staking pools, all of the sort of things that uh, a lot of exchanges and uh, any sort of asset management firms would want to do with cryptocurrencies. Right. So you talked about digital assets, cryptocurrency, right? And I think a lot of um, the audience, uh, when they hear digital assets, is also about cryptocurrency, but it's more than that. It's about NFTs, it's about CBDCs, uh, stable coins, um, ownership uh, certificates of real world assets like wine, real estate, right? Mm -hmm. And all these are coming under this umbrella term called tokenization. What is tokenization? Because this term, I think a lot of us have been hearing it for in the recent couple of years. Mm -hmm. So what is the purpose of tokenization? And, you know, what are the key principles behind the concept? Yeah, look, I think, first of all, what is a token? Um, and this is kind of going down to the fundamentals of blockchains and, and the ability to have a decentralized ledger of potentially assets or, uh, you know, units of account. So a token on a blockchain is really a representation of an object that is built on top of the blockchain. Anyone who has access to that blockchain can create a new standard or a standard of or unit of account and can be verified by a number of people. Now this could be, um, you know, as you said, like tokenizing wine. So say I've got a thousand bottles of wine and I want to fractionalize the ownership of those thousand bottles of wine. Um, I can now tokenize that and say I take those thousand bottles and turn it to 10,000 tokens. Mm -hmm. I have now broken down each bottle of wine by a factor of 10. So I can have a one-tenth of that wine bottle of ownership. So really sort of tokenization is about the ability to move ownership of assets, whether they be uh, virtual assets or physical, you know, redeemable assets, um, as a unit of account on a blockchain. And this is happening everywhere. It's happening over public and private chains. Um, you brought out a few uh uh, terminology, I think some audience might, f you know, not be familiar with, like consensus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, frac fractionalization. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was going to ask you a question about, you know, how audience or users, newcomers to the cryptocurrency space, they can get to know more about what these terms mean. But before I come to that question, right, you also talked about blockchain. Now, blockchain um, and tokenization. I think for many of us, when we think about blockchain, it's Bitcoin, you know, uh, it's a big milestone, right? Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, there have been a lot of innovations in the recent years that drive all these uh, 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 use cases of, you know, tokenizing wine, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you think are the sort of the key sort of uh, events in the blockchain innovation space that users should be aware of? Yeah, look, so brief history of blockchains, it's really sort of going to, um, the one which everyone sort of knows of is, is uh, Bitcoin. So back in 2009, um, the evolution of the ability to tokenize a unit of accounts, so the Bitcoins on the Bitcoin chain. Um, and this proved quite popular, you know, right through until sort of like uh, 2012, 2013, where it was understood by some uh, some developers that there are limitations to this. Like you are literally just talking about one asset. Um, and this is where the emergence of the Ethereum Foundation came about. So Vitalik Buterin um, created the Ethereum blockchain. Operates very much in the same way as Bitcoin, where there's a consensus mechanism, there's that word again. <laughs> right, consensus. Um, where uh, you can validate that an asset has moved. The one difference with uh, the Ethereum blockchain was that they created what they call the Ethereum virtual machine. So this actually allowed more flexibility with the blockchain to start adding additional assets onto the blockchain other than that base asset. So like coins, tokens, uh, NFTs. Um, so that sort of evolution with Ethereum, it's really sort of took off a broader utility of these blockchains. Um, and then as this uh, consensus and virtual machine or execution model has uh, matured over the years, it's allowed for much greater number of use cases. So I can deploy a smart contract on that blockchain to control 
the trading of tokens. So they're now sort of looking at the more mature use cases. There's now private versions of these chains. So uh, they call them layer twos or roll-ups. So Polygon is a is a layer two. Right. It's a good example of this. Um, where even you know advantages of the blockchain becomes faster. There's more efficient use of those chains. And then there's now new blockchains coming out which use different consensus, such as Solana. So each of these different chains, each of their different fundamental pro, um, properties is allowing for new use cases to, to come about. An example is USDC. What part is USDC? USDC, <laughs> oh, okay, yes. USDC is, uh, is, a, is a token. Um, it's tokenized US dollars, which sits on the blockchain. So effectively, uh, a company called Circle, what they did is they created a large treasury of funds, both cash and US bonds. And then for each of those $1 units, whether it be a cash dollar or a treasury bond unit of dollar, they then minted and created USDC tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. So those tokens are one for one cash for a US dollar mm. and can be used to trade, purchase things, um, and effectively pay for goods based on that USDC. So as an end user, I could take my digital wallet, mm. I can buy some or trade into some USDC, and then I can go and pay a retailer with that USDC, and that retailer receives effectively $1. So I think it's one of those sort of cases where, um, you know, as an end user, you can just sort of say, okay, I can function, I can send payments, um, without necessarily having to know how the fundamentals of the blockchain actually works. Yeah, so for example, if I want to send a US dollar, 100 US dollars across to, say, yourself, right, mm -hmm. based in New Zealand, mm -hmm. right, rather than going to the bank, I can purchase a USDC and then send it to your uh, blockchain wallet. Correct, and, right? correct. And there's a lot of advantages for doing that. Um, and this is sort of now looking at, like, what are the use cases for these tokens? Um, we, Traditionally today, for example, if I, as you said, you wanted to send some funds to me in New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, if you were based in Singapore, you would have to deal with your local bank. They would then talk to a correspondent bank. The correspondent banks would then send funds to each other. Then the uh, correspondent bank in New Zealand would then have to fund a regional bank account, and then the money would end up in my, my bank account. Now, this process could take anywhere from two to five days for that to happen, and generally a high associated cost. So... Often in some countries like Singapore and New Zealand, there is quite a few money flows, but some countries are particularly disadvantaged where that particular money flow may not be handled by the mm -hmm. banks and you have to go to um, you know, Western Union or something like that. And unfortunately for the people trying to send those funds, it could the fees associated could be 10% of the actual transaction value. Um, so where the blockchain comes in with the advantages that if I'm signing a transaction or you're signing mm -hmm. some US dollars over to me, the cost to you is minimal. It's just a really very, very small amount of a mm -hmm. fee, which is called gas, um, that is paid in order for the transaction to move on the blockchain. So really what it's doing is it's really sort of helping with efficient money flows and also opening up um, you know, new channels for payments for different uh people in different markets, and also for industry as well. Mm -hmm. So an example is um, if I'm uh, a commodities trader and I've got a boat of coal sitting in a port of Africa and I need to get that boat on its way, but I need to settle that payment first. Um, using traditional payment rails, that could take five to 10 days to clear, but if I can actually settle in USDC, that boat can leave this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So it really sort of changes the way that you know, some of the pain points of traditional finance mm. are now being met with a, uh, a new sort of payment rail that can be used to settle financial transactions. You talk about the fees being a fraction of the traditional sort of uh, banking uh, uh, fees, right? What about speed? Because I think a lot of uh, uh, users would also mention, you know, when it comes to Bitcoin, not necessarily USDC, but when mm. it comes to Bitcoin, right? It's very... Uh, famous that you know there's the, the, the transaction speed is way slower than say a tr typical visa transaction right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what, what what about speed and what is been done to you know is it a valid concern yeah look it is a valid concern so if I was to go down to my local coffee shop and try and pay for a coffee with BTC 
uh, I, I, my coffee would be cold by the time <laughs> that they actually received the funds. So that's it's not a great use case for payments. Um, and this really sort of goes down to the fundamentals of the blockchains that are being used for different payment types. Um, so there are faster blockchains out there. So Ethereum is a little bit faster. Um, then you've got Polygon, which uses a roll-up, which is even faster because it can collect a, a ton of transactions in one batch mm -hmm. and, and verify them. Um, but now the emergence of uh, different blockchains like Solana, they have a finality of one second. So effectively, you can have one second from the payment time and the person on the other side receiving those funds. Um, and we are seeing more emergence of different blockchains that are very, very specified for high throughput. So you know they can do upwards of 30,000 transactions per second. So really for the different use cases that exist in the markets, in some cases USDC on Ethereum, and it takes like maybe five minutes to get confirmed, that's absolutely fine. Um, but for any sort of high-speed use cases, there are now blockchains that are being used for this today. Right, five minutes is a lot faster than a cross-border US dollar, you know, bank transfer, isn't it, anyways? Indeed. <laughs> Another concern, I think, when it comes to user adoption, right, it just struck, struck me, actually, uh, is privacy, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the key characteristics or selling point of blockchain is its transparency, but that's also something that people are concerned about. Yes. So yep. what, what has been you know, done in that space to address this concern? Is it a valid concern? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a valid concern. And look, I think for, from a retail use case for end users, just you know, having some tokens that they can pay for things or transfer a trade in and out of currencies, not a big issue. Mm. But when it comes down to real world asset tokenization, so this is when you're sort of like tokenizing securities or tokenizing bonds, and then you've got institutions that are doing it on behalf of users, there is a certain amount of privacy that needs to be undertaken as like who actually owns these assets, do they want it known to the public or not? Mm -hmm. um, so how this is being managed is, is now using uh, what we'd say is private blockchains. So they are blockchains that only have access to specific institutions. So they can build those tokens, build those networks, and build that user base in a private manner. Now, there is some questions about like, hey, this is a closed loop ecosystem. Is it really viable for a broader financial use case? Um, so now we're seeing an emergence of what we call cross-chain uh, cross bridging. Mm. So effectively having that privacy and security, but certain parts of that transaction are communicated out onto a public blockchain or a public ledger so that there is that sort of proof of the transactions happening, but not releasing who are the end owners of those assets. Coming to the data terminologies, consensus, uh, staking, right? Um, you brought up another new term, uh, cross-chain bridging, right? Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to awareness and education and understanding all the com complicated t terminologies, I was uh, speaking to another uh, speaker at uh, the Singapore FinTech Festival, mm -hmm. actually, and we talked about whether it's necessary for consumers to understand the technology. And she brought up this very interesting analogy. You know, we use the internet, we use the, you know, the... The, the banking, the traditional banking infrastructure, but we don't ask, you know, what are the sort of uh, scripts running, you know, on the website, you know, mm. what, whether it's what kind of database is running the traditional sort of banking infrastructure. So, yeah. so once the user experience improves dramatically, then the questions about what is happening in the background will hopefully, you know, become a secondary concern. Yeah, exactly. And it's a great analogy with the internet is that, um, you know, web 1.0 or 0 0.5, if you want to call it, uh, when first websites uh, came out, they were very rudimentary and, and anyone who was on those websites were actually very much into, you know, understanding how the code works and, you know, you actually had to have some sort of technical nuance to use it properly. But nowadays, like, you know, a three-year-old child can pick up any sort of website and start hitting buttons and have a great user experience. So I think we will see the emergence of pretty much the same path as what the internet has done for society, blockchain will now evolve into a point that it has a very high utility, but a low barrier to entry. Right, so the, uh, the history of internet is what, um, half a century, 50 years now? Mm. So are we going so. to be waiting for another <clears throat> sort of like 20, I don't know, 30 years before the blockchain <laughs> becomes usable, well, where a three-year-old can pick up? <laughs> well, actually, when you sort of look at the history of blockchain, yes, Bitcoin was the most popular, but actually blockchains and distributed ledgers were being built in the early 2000s. Yeah, is, yeah, so, <clears throat> so in actual fact, um, we have got, you know, 20 plus years of experience so far. So we're well into this 
the sort of emergence of the technology. And I think, um, you know, and it, it's it's maturing at an exponential rate. Mm. Um, we at Firebox, we get to see a lot of the new emerging technologies, the providers in the region. We're powering a lot of these businesses as well. And the, the scope and breadth of what uh, businesses are able to produce using the blockchain now is astounds me. Every single week I'm surprised at the new products which are coming out. So I think we will be seeing um, really good sort of consumer utility products coming out, um, if not this year, but in the, in the two or three years following. Right, so great. So that leads me to the next question. What are the kind of market trends that you will predict are for you know, the next couple of years? Ah, uh, yes. Um, so yes, there's a lot of speculation going on in the market. Bitcoin is uh, is definitely showing itself to be a uh, a solid unit of account and and source of value, um, and I think that will continue as well. I don't want to speculate on the price, but I think it's it's now been proven as a utility asset. Um, I think in the use cases for different uh, blockchain technology, I think stable coins mm. is going to be really important. So a stable coin is effectively an asset backed token where the uh, backing is either going to be cash deposits, it could be treasury bonds, um, it could be um, uh, CBDC, so central bank mm-hmm. uh, digital currencies. Um, but effectively, people using those stable coins for a method of settlement, um, either from a retail perspective, but more importantly, from a uh, commercial perspective. So we're seeing at Fireblocks a lot more flow of the stablecoin assets like USDC, USDT, um, uh, and, and that has really accelerated in the last year. Oh, so okay. businesses settling with other businesses using stable coins opposed to using traditional banking rails oh. for that very reason that it's faster and cheaper for them to do. Right, and of course, uh, you mentioned that we cannot really speculate on the uh, price direction of Bitcoin, but that's a exciting space to watch as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so one final question. Mm-hmm. Do you have NFTs? I do have NFTs, uh, but not particularly good ones. Uh, I definitely don't have any bored apes. Um, <laughs> uh, look, yeah, NFTs I, I have out of interest, um, but... I think there has been a lot of speculation on their on their price, and we've seen uh, the massive highs and the massive lows um, associated with them. Um, NFTs, are, you know, I think they've got a really good utility case, um, other than speculation. Um, you know, NFTs can represent art, and if that particular piece of art, yes, it's going to have an intrinsic value associated mm-hmm. with that artist. Um, but there's other things which NFTs can be used for. So these can be things like proof of attendance. They can be tickets on a plane. They could be... Um, you wine know, collection. Wine, yeah, wine collections. And But look, I, I see there's, there's quite a few options for use cases, especially um, around retail. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, NFTs, for, so rewards to people for maybe spending over a certain amount. You may get a... 50% off NFT token. Mm-hmm. That NFT token can then be used maybe at the same retailer or can be used across different retailers. So cross-promotional, um, there's a lot of different things that can be done mm-hmm. via NFTs uh, in the market today. Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, exciting uh, events that happened in the uh, recent couple of years, like the explosion of NFTs. Uh, you, you say that it went through highs and lows, mm-hmm. uh, and now Bitcoin and stable coins, right? So it's uh, developments that's go- going to really drive people's, further drive people's interest in blockchain, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So really grateful that you are able to spend some time with us today to give a really brief introduction into blockchain and tokenization and really get us to start embarking on this journey because that kind of technology is not going to go away anytime soon. Absolutely not. Yep, it's here to stay for sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Cheers.